The right to vote is at the core of our democracy. But what right looks like is the center of a lot of debate. Are new laws really just new hurdles to voting? Or are they protecting our way of life? This week, we look at voting rights. What information do I need to make an educated decision and to make sure that my vote actually counts? As midterm election races fire up, this is The Race. Who you vote for is a deeply personal decision. Only you can make it. But when it comes to predicting who will win elections, oftentimes groups are looked at from a bird's eye view. Latino voters are expected to have a huge impact on several key races this fall. But the Latino voters we spoke with say, if they're only looked at as Latino, we're not looking close enough. The theater can be a place for us to escape reality. I don't think you can really love anything if you can't be honest with it. But the drama of our real world, the details sweep back onto the stage. Gives Cuban-American playwright Carmen Palais plenty of material. And I think if theater is going to properly reflect life or hold up a mirror to reality, it, it has to be political in one way or another. She isn't afraid of getting political in her shows. Her latest, performed at a theater in Miami, is called The Cuban Vote. We have a candidate that's all focused on issues and substance and actions, and then a candidate that's beloved by the community, but offers very little in terms of policy or action or change. She provided us these images of the show. She plays the main character. She used to work on Democratic political campaigns, but her show isn't about one political party. It's performance, drawn from life experience as a Cuban-American. Perspective she feels gets lost in the national conversation about Latino voters. Socialism is going to mean something very different to a Mexican than it's going to mean to a Venezuelan. And social equity is going to mean two very different things to a Cuban than it will to a Colombian. According to the census, Hispanic or Latino heritage can derive from more than 20 different countries. We're very different communities with certain things in common and, and also very different um, realities. Michelle Hausman is the show's creative director. He's an American citizen born and raised in Venezuela, where the economy has collapsed as the result of political instability. I've lived through the destruction of my country. I, I lived through how we were the longest running democracy in Latin America, and we kind of took it for granted. His experience is different from that of Esmeralda Vieira. I feel like we are no longer the Latino vote, right? We are a pot of generations, a pot of millennials, a pot of different upbringings, of different cultures. We met Esmeralda in Nevada. She's a first-generation Mexican-American who's an independent voter. Immigration is a very controversial topic, believe it or not, amongst Latinos as well. There's also a misperception out there that somehow Latinos immigration is like the number one issue. And it's actually it might be for perhaps, perhaps if you're a Mexican immigrant, that might be. But if you're a Florida Republican, the second, third generation, it's not. Data backs up what Northwestern University political science professor Jaime Dominguez is saying. Ahead of the 2020 presidential race, Pew Research asked Latino voters what issues they considered very important. Immigration was outnumbered by seven other issues. The economy was number one. So the opportunity, for example, for Latinos or Latinas, right, to be able to elect uh, uh, more representatives that mirror that population's growth to be represented in the halls of Congress, I think that only then will you begin to have more conversations about the diversity and these cleavages within the Latino collective. Dominguez says campaigns need to do a better job of outreach with an understanding of the growing diversity within the Latino voting bloc, because democracy, like performance, takes practice. You have to work on it every day, otherwise you'll fall apart. And when it falls apart, it's almost impossible to put back together. After 19 states passed stricter voting laws last year, some feel our elections are going to be a lot more secure because of it. However, some members of black communities from these states say that they feel targeted. As we hear more about these laws being passed, discussed, how they're impacting voters in the midterms, they say they just want more people to understand where they're coming from. 
Yes, this is our election protection boiler room where we are tracking and monitoring everything that's happening across our elections. Tucked into an event space, members of the New Georgia Project are monitoring the voter experience of their 2022 primary election. After voting, they say, is becoming increasingly harder to do. The nonpartisan group's goal is to get more people registered to vote. New laws that attack your voting rights, that limit your voting options, are harmful, particularly to the black community. Georgia is one of at least 19 states that, after false claims of widespread voter fraud after the 2020 election, have enacted stricter voter laws, according to the Brennan Center, with more laws in more states being added to the books this year. Some of these laws do things like limit early voting sites, decrease the number of drop boxes, require identification on mail-in ballots, and give states more control over county elections. Proponents believe these have been enacted in good faith, with Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia saying, quote, this bill expands voting access, streamlines vote counting procedures, and ensures election integrity. However, opponents of the laws say they unfairly make it harder to cast a ballot. Why we're seeing this barrage of laws, they say, is because of something that happened in 2013. That's when a Supreme Court decision took away some of the federal checks on changes to voting laws first made in the 1965 Civil Rights Act. 200 polling place closures happened back in 2013 after that decision was passed down. We also had things that we saw in Georgia and other states like voter ID restrictions that made it more difficult for people to access the ballot. When we were volunteering, and noticing how in black communities, people stood in line for long periods of time compared to other communities. Gina Gunn McClendon is a researcher at Washington University who studies voter access and engagement. She says laws that create more barriers to voting, including having to have a certain photo ID to vote or having to request an absentee ballot in person, also can create voter subversion or so much distrust in the system that it discourages people from casting a vote. So the whole idea is to keep people afraid and just say, forget it, I'm not gonna go vote. The Brennan Center reports that there are 76 active lawsuits in 21 states against stricter voting laws. To say that there's an issue with the integrity of our elections here in Georgia, prove it. There's a lot of mistrust in the election system and many folks say they don't know who or what to believe anymore. What opponents of these laws hope others understand is how they impact people who may be different from them. We want people to have faith in our democracy. It's what makes our country what it is. And if you have our leaders who are constantly dumping on our system, constantly undermining uh, what our system should be, then you're going to have less people participate. We won't let that happen. I'm Vanessa Mishan, you're reporting. The people who work here, who are supposed to represent you, have to do one thing first. They have to get elected. But in a lot of states this year, that has been made complicated because of something known as gerrymandering or redistricting. I'm Joe St. George, and before we go any further, let's start with what is gerrymandering. It's named after a founding father you probably couldn't name, Elbridge Jerry. He was a former vice president under President Madison, but it was when he was governor of Massachusetts that his name became synonymous with drawing controversial lines. The map he signed into law included a district in Boston that legend has it looked like a salamander. Ever since then, every 10 years or so in this country, some politicians decide to draw partisan lines. Why do they do this? Well, sometimes they're forced to because of a census. Other times, because of political opportunity. Sometimes by putting more city voters who tend to vote Democratic in the same district as suburban voters, you can make a district more likely to vote Democrat. Republicans can do the same thing by putting more conservative rural voters into a suburban district, making it more likely to vote Republican. What is really interesting about the redistricting process this year is how the maps still aren't settled in some states. In the state of Florida, legal battles continue after Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law his version of a fair new map. Many voting rights groups say it hurts the chances of black representation. It's not just Republicans who do this. New York's Court of Appeals ruled the map in that state drawn by Democrats was too partisan. Judges demanded a new one, and now longtime representatives Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler must run against each other. They're friends. In Ohio, it got so bad this year that a federal court actually said in approving a set of maps, our options were limited, so we chose the best of our bad options. Some primaries were delayed for months as a result. So is every state bad with drawing lines? No. These 10 states draw their maps using independent or bipartisan commissions. And while there was certainly controversy in those states over maps this year, it was much less than in the states where the political party in power 
drew the lines. Now, if you live in a state where redistricting, gerrymandering has been difficult this year, expect new reforms to be introduced in the coming years. After all, lawmakers will do this all again in 2031. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George. A new effort to recruit poll workers ahead of this year's midterm elections. You're watching the race.